I guess today we're talking about the Civil War. Sons of hill and plain, come listen to my feeble strain. Perhaps you'll think it all a dream, though every line is true. I'll sing to you of our long campaign through summer sun and winter's rain to Richmond's gates and back again. I will relate to you. It was in August '61 that Colonel Owen took command and brought us into Maryland. Then let it be no shine. He drilled us every day. We rose to learn us how to thrust our hoes and dogs and how they felt the blows of the Gavin '69. In February '62, when passing in a grand review, we were told. Okay, hey, yeah, we're back. It's me. It really is. It's your good buddy, Thorne. And I know what you're thinking. What the hell, Thorne? Today we're going to talk about the American Civil War. Alright, so, you know me from LARPing. Uh, live action role play, we're doing fantasy stuff, we're, doing, we're dressing up in costume, and we're pretending to fight other people. Some of you know me as a historian that uh, kind of brings history and realism into re... Uh, history and realism into LARPing. Or at least we try to. We try to be as realistic as possible. Some of you might know me as a historian that uh, does quite a bit of different stuff. Uh, American Civil War is one of them. Uh, <laughs> so, Taking that interest in reenacting and bringing it into LARPing uh, only happened to me about 12 years ago, 12, 15 years ago. It's kind of like live Dungeons and Dragons. And I said, I played Dungeons and Dragons when I was a kid, and we've talked about that too. Uh, and I said, yeah, this would be a great thing. And so I kind of went and I had an outstanding time. I really had a great time doing it. I really enjoy LARPing. It's a lot of fun. In fact, most of this channel, most of my entire channel. Hi, Cinnamon. Hi, Cinnamon. Meow. Cat's here. Uh, Cinnamon. Cinnamon. We're trying to talk about the Civil War. So you don't care who won? No, nobody fought for cats' rights. It was not about cats' rights. It was about cats' rights? There you go. From the cat's mouth. So anyway, <laughs> quiet your crazy cat. Okay, so anyway, uh, hot shoe, silly cat. What was I talking about? Civil War stuff, I know. Anyway, so I got involved into this whole LARP experience, which is what this channel is all about. But before I did LARPing, before I did airsofting, I did American Civil War. So one of my very first um, memories of the Civil War when I was a kid growing up, one of my very first books my mother used to read to me was The Golden Age of History, um, or the Golden Age books, The Golden Book of the Civil War. This was such a fantastic book, it was from by American Heritage, really put my love of history in it. Uh, the stories my mother used to read me, but what really got me were the maps that they did of all these little battles. This is a fantastic book. You can still find it. Um, these are the maps I was talking about. You can still find this book on Amazon for about $35. This is a 1961 edition. Uh, <laughs> it's just a great book. It's a great starter book. But the photographs and the history of this is what really got me involved and interested in the Civil War. Now, when I grew up, I always wanted to be a soldier. I joined the Army, did my first tour, took a college option, went to college, and in that class, or in, that, in those classes, I took a, a, a class on the Civil War. Fantastic class. 
But in talking to that professor, I wanted to know what was it really like. And I, I was trying to explain to him my experiences as an infantryman in the modern times in the 1980s and trying to relate it to being a Civil War soldier. And he recommended that I go talk to a friend of his who was a reenactor. And I went and I spoke to Paul Reisig, a uh, fantastic man, great knowledge. And uh, he said, hey, if you're interested in learning about the Civil War, we have a, a, uh, a training weekend this, this weekend. And that's a uh, event where they got together and practiced being a Civil War soldier. It's exactly what it sounds like. And, uh, and I said, God, that sounds really exciting, but uh, I don't have any gear. And he says, <laughs> don't worry, we have gear for you. Little did I know that was the hook that would involve me in 30 some years of reenacting. From that weekend, I got hooked big time and I started going to events. I bought my first rifle. Uh, I, I started doing more and more. Uh, I met my future mother-in-law in that class, then met her daughter, who I eventually married and divorced, but that's a long story. Um, and her love of history mirrored mine. And so my father-in-law and mother-in-law would go to Civil War events. He was much older. He didn't, uh, he portrayed a civilian. And my whole family went to reenacting. Uh, and it was a great thing. And, and due to a few reasons I got out of it. Um, uh, mostly because the military, uh, I went back in the military, or went back to active duty, and the military took my time away from that. Okay, a lot of history to get to where I'm talking about now. Okay, so so here I am now, dressed as a Civil War soldier. <laughs> okay, uh, a lot of talking to get to this point. So why am I bringing reenacting into this channel? Uh, because this is supposedly about LARPing. This is going to piss a lot of people off, especially in the historic community, but reenacting is really LARPing. It's, uh, we're playing a role. We are role playing. I'm playing a soldier. Uh, it's done live. So it's live in action because we're fighting each other. Role play. It's live action role play. It's LARPing. <laughs> That's going to piss a lot of historians and reenactors. Oh, I'll do this for... <laughs> no, you're LARPers. You just don't know it. <laughs> but that's okay. It's not a dirty word. It's just a different way to do the same thing we're doing. Okay? So, anyway. <laughs> that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Alright? So, that being said, let's talk about what I'm wearing right now. If you have never done any reenacting at all, uh, or any his historical reenacting, and I've talked about that before, um, you'll know that we try to take historical uh, evidence and build upon that in order to develop a persona or a outfit or whatever you want to call it to relive history. Living history is what we call it. Um, and so I am dressed pretty much in your typical uniform of a Union soldier from 1861 up until 1865. This is pretty much the standard basic uniform, okay? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's trousers in a sky blue kersey. Um, it's brogans, leather boots of the style and the time period. It is a four button fatigue jacket or blouse and a forage cap or kepi and in this case it does have a brass letter on the top of it that symbolizes which company I am in my infantry regiment okay this is pretty much a standard infantry uniform um, and it, it changed a little bit over time and there were some variations by regiment, and we're going to talk about that. The standard uniform uh, was issued to soldiers throughout the entire war. It is a four button sack coat. Uh, it's called a sack coat and not a frock coat, which is the earlier style, which give me a second and I will show you. Uh, this was made basically for fatigue duties. It's pretty, it's supposed to be pretty billowy and loose. I've gained a little bit of weight and size since I first bought this jacket. This is by a good company called uh, Jarnigan. Uh, it is unlined, 
It is made of wool. It has an interior pocket. Um, but it's pretty light. It's a pretty light jacket. Uh, this was meant to be worn on fatigue duties uh, when you're doing something else, just like the forage cap. The forage cap is a fatigue cap. It is not the dress cap. This was made by uh, New Columbia. This was the very first piece of reenacting stuff that I ever got. This cap is probably older than some of you people. It's about 30, 35. Well, I think I got the, when did I get this? This would have been 88. So it is 30, this cap is 30 years old. This jacket is probably about 20 years old. I hardly ever wear it because uh, I have other jackets that I wear. Um, but it's a very nice jacket. Uh, it's not, it's not hardcore. <laughs> it's more meh, upper mainstream, but it's a pretty nice jacket. Underneath this, I'm wearing a civilian shirt, not my issue shirt. Um, the issue shirt was a, a not another flannel shirt in this style, long sleeve button. Um, and I'm just not wearing it because it's kind of warm today. And we're gonna go out. We're gonna go outside and do some filming with all my kid on, and and so I'm wearing a little lighter jacket. Okay, but as you can see, most of these were lined. This one is not. Just period for comfort. Uh, it is got a very non-historic reenactor label in it. Made in America by American workers. All natural fibers. Uh, hand wash, cool water, dry. Don't do not steam press. So when you're talking jackets, you can really spend a lot of money. And uh, probably now, Wamba and White is probably the best company to get them from. They run about two hundred dollars. This one cost me about one hundred and twenty back in the day. This was top of the line in its time. And now we've moved on, unfortunately. So, my trousers are sky blue kersey. They are also world. These are manufactured by uh, Blockade Runner. Um, these suspenders hold up the pants. There was no waist belt issued. Suspenders weren't issued, surprisingly. And uh, underneath this is a pair of cotton long underwear, uh, which I'm not going to show you. And uh, then I got my wool brogans, or my, my, my leather brogans, and a pair of cotton wool socks on. Um, and this is kind of what the camp look was. So, but if you remember, I talked about that dress uniform for a minute. Let me show you what that is. Now, I am wearing a copy of a early war or militia frock coat cut in the federal style. Um, it is a nine bucket button front, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are no hooks and eyes in this one, but normally if it was a federal issue, there would be a hook and eye at the top. It does have a functional cuff. It does have functional tail with pockets. And it's piped on the collar and the cuffs in, in infantry blue. This would have been the dress uniform. Uh, worn with the hardy hat, but often worn with the bummer or the fatigue cap. Um, a lot of soldiers wore this at the beginning of the war or during the winter months. It is a lot warmer. It is padded. It is lined. Um, there's pockets a few places. And uh, it's just kind of a nicer uniform. It is heavier and it is hotter. So during the summer campaigning, active campaigning, they went with that sack coat that we were talking about before. Uh, this is a very nice look. This is often worn by sergeants, uh, just to make it look a little nicer. And uh, it, it kind of reflects the slightly earlier clothing styles of the frock coat. Gentlemen in civilian life would be wearing a frock coat. And towards the 1860s, the working class be wearing a style of the sack coat for their working day and uh, that's kind of what it mirrors okay so with my accoutrements on or my, my war fighting gear on this looks pretty good and uh, let me show you that here real quick okay start off with once I figure out where it's at my cartridge box and I'm not going to go into detail on a lot of this stuff because a lot of these videos have been done and done by people that are a lot better than I am. 
but my cartridge box is 69 caliber. You can hear the tins rattling in there, carried by this waist strap or the shoulder strap with a chest or a breast eagle on it. This was thrown over the shoulder. And uh, as you're fighting, your ammunition was carried in here, and you reach back, open it up, pulled out a round. Now, over the top of this was my waist belt. My waist belt, leather belt with a buckle on it. This one happens to be State of New York. Uh, I do portray a New York troop. Uh, this is early war federal or early war militia. Uh, as the war went on, these were probably U.S. buckles. But right at the beginning, the state of New York did issue leather gear like this. And when worn, you've got your bayonet pouch or a bayonet scabbard. You've got your cap pouch. Now the caps are the little uh, percussion caps used to fire the musket. Look it up. I'm not going to talk about it. So, basic soldier costume or basic soldier equipment, waist belt, cap pouch, bayonet scabbard, hello cinnamon, cartridge box, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of dressed up a little bit. Uh, in addition to this, a normal standard soldier would have carried a haversack, which is your ration bag, and a canteen. Haversack is a, is, uh, a cloth, uh, tarred or painted bag. Cinnamon. Thrown over the shoulder, usually carry it up to three days of rations, about two and a half, three pounds worth. My canteen. Throw it over the shoulder, three pints worth. And uh, I'm outfitted to be in going to combat. This is a uniform. So, standing in line of battle with my musket, which I've got my. My 1842 Springfield Smoothbore. I am a pre war soldier. Or militia, um, it, or even you know even Bull Run. Um, this could be an outfit. Uh, this could be <laughs> this could be a uniform that they were wearing. Uh, the bayonet does come off. I swear. There we go. Uh, a long bayonet when you wear it on your waist. It makes the look of the soldier. And uh, a lot of a lot of soldiers went into battle wearing this. So this is the standard dress uniform, like I said. There's one other that I want to show you real quick. And now this last jacket that I want to talk to you about today is very specific to the unit that we do. Uh, well, actually, it's just, it, it is very specific to New York Volunteer Infantry Regiments, and it is called the New York State Jacket. Now, besides the, the frock coat and the sack coat, a lot of the state-run regiments were issued state-cut jackets. A little fancier, um, and as the war went on, less and less of it was done, and more and more of the federal issue stuff was seen. But in early 61, 62, and in our case, up until Gettysburg in 63, there were units being issued these state jackets. Now this is a is a fantastic copy of the jacket made in uh, I purchased from Blockade Runner. I can't I can't talk enough about Blockade Runner. Pretty much his whole outfit, with the exception of the cap, right at the moment is Blockade Runner. Uh, it has epaulets and it has a nine button front with uh, New York State muffin buttons. It has. Um, uh, doesn't have buttons on the cuff. Uh, some of them would have buttons on the cuff. It do has has two belt loops. Uh, to kind of holds your belt up a little bit. Now the New York jacket was issued to a lot of state units, uh, New York state units. As I was saying, up until about '63, uh, we know that there were returns in '63 with the newly raised companies of the 69th New York that met up with the the regiment after Gettysburg that were issued these. How long these jackets lasted on campaign? 
uh, photographic evidence has some. But if you're doing a generic infantry impression, which is kind of the move towards, uh, a sack coat would be perfect and probably worn more. If you wear a sack coat with this, you'll fit in no matter if you go to any reenactment. You'll be fine. This is a very nice jacket though. I really enjoy it. Uh, it really fits in with our impression. And uh, the 69th New York, uh, Company K, and uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a niche impression. I'm putting on a different hat. That was the Federal Forage cap. This is a bummer cap, which is a uh, a slightly different version, um, but very common. Um, our company, Company K, was formed uh, prior to the war by uh, Thomas Meager, and after Bull Run and they fought at Bull Run. After Bull Run, it was organized in with the 69th New York Volunteers. And, and so that's kind of what we portray. Um, this would be our standard uniform uh, in 62, let me button a button, in 62 during the Peninsula, Antietam, and Fredericksburg, along with, frock, or along with the sack coat being worn. Uh, pretty standard, it's not that bad. Uh, the forage cap or the bummer cap would have been worn. My other pattern could have also been worn. These are kind of the same manufacturing process, just slightly different caps. This has got a different top to it, a little bigger. Um, and then a third cap could be worn, which is a smaller chasseur cap, um, probably earlier in the war. And with the company designation letter and the 69th New York. Now any three of these caps could be worn early war and the later you go in the war the more common you would see the forage cap of either style and uh, photographs of them of members of the regiment show predominantly the bummer or the forage cap being worn. Not so many slouch caps or slouch hats, but this kind of hat being worn. So that's kind of what we're looking at portraying as a unit. And uh, you know what? Let's get all this gear on. And you know, I've talked quite a bit. Let's go outside and uh, see what it all looks like when we put it all together, shall we? All right, let's go. So, how are you guys doing? It's uh, pretty early in the morning. And we've done a few, we've done a few miles already, uh, just testing everything out. Uh, like you didn't, if you didn't know, I, I retired out of the army after 29, uh, almost 30 years as an infantry guy. And I spent a lot of time walking and marching and in columns and formations and what have you, mostly route marches and, uh, Guys in the Civil War were doing the same thing with, ironically, about the same amount of equipment and weight that they were carrying. Uh, I am fully kitted out uh, with full uniform. I got my uh, my 42 Springfield, my smoothbore. Uh, well, let's just start from the bottom. I've got my brogans on. Yeah, good old gum boats and. Uh, my federal I issue underwear underneath this. I've got my light blue trousers, my New York State jacket. Uh, I do have my shirt on underneath it. This is all wool, with the exception of the shirt is cotton. It's a nice cotton shirt. The equipment that I'm carrying today, I've got my waist belt, which supports my cart or my uh, cap box to for my percussion caps. I've got my bayonet. And on my rifle and my scabbard. Uh, I've got my haversack full of three days rations, my canteen. Uh, this is three three pint canteen, a smooth side. Um, across my chest here is uh, my cartridge box strap and uh, with its with its cartridge box strap plate, my chest plate or breast plate. I am wearing my haversack today, uh, fully loaded. It's got um, 
Well, it's got my shelter half. It's got my blanket. It's got my gum blanket. It has an extra shirt, extra pair of drawers, underwear, extra socks, housewife, or my toiletry bags, and a few other odds and ends. Um, I'm wearing my my uh, my bummer cap or my my forage cap. Uh, this would have been pretty standard for for infantry units in '62. This is kind of the look we're going for right now. Uh, the 69th New York in 1862 took part in the uh, Peninsula Campaign. They took part in Antietam. They took part in Fredericksburg. Uh, they were in the thick of the fight for a lot of the ways. Uh, Company K, which is what we portray, uh, slowly dwindled down. And uh, by Fredericksburg, they didn't have very many effectives uh, or soldiers on the battlefield. They were pretty shot up. And in 63, went into summer camp or winter camp and got some recruiting up. But it wasn't until after Gettysburg that a new levy of soldiers came in and brought that regiment back up. I think at Gettysburg, because the 69th were at Gettysburg, uh, about 280, 300 soldiers on the field out of the original complement of 1,000 infantrymen. So pretty, pretty serious losses through combat and uh, disease. Uh, a lot of guys um, didn't die of wounds, they died of sickness, which is something that uh, is touched upon in history classes, but not that much. One of the weird things, uh, one of the interesting things about the 69th, the, uh, they carried a 69 uh, caliber smoothbore, uh, it's a big heavy heavy piece, this is a Springfield, and uh, it fires a huge bullet, uh, a little smaller than my thumb, but it is a smooth bore, in fact it ranges about 100, 100 meters or so, 100 meters. Now the rifles, Enfields and Springfields that were the majority of the weapons on the field of battle, we had an effective range of about 250 yards. So. A little bit of a disadvantage for the Irish Brigade going into combat, wasn't it? The idea behind it uh, by, uh, by General Cochran and uh, then Thomas Meagher, General Meagher, he truly believed that the Irish possessed an innate fighting skill and uh, were better fighters than anybody else. And the concept was to go in with a buck and ball, which is a round ball and three, four buckshot, fire one volley, maybe two, and then charge in with a bayonet. And that would take the field. And uh, they showed it time and time again at Fredericksburg, just how brave these guys were, going uphill into a murderous fight and with uh, not much of a chance. And all the way through the war, they carried the smoothbore. Some of the flank companies, uh, Company K, for instance, a, a lot of other guys, we're picking up rifled infields on the on the battlefield because, well, let's face it, there was plenty of weapons laying around, and we're using the rifles, um, and so the returns of the 69th show that there were some rifles, but a majority of them all the way through the war were, were smooth bores. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, when I first got started in reenacting a long time ago. Uh, I did it because I wanted to know what the soldiers felt like when they were doing this. Um, having seen combat myself, quite a bit of it, I, I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine what it was like um, standing there. Well, I, because even the stuff that I've seen, and I, I, was, I was involved quite a bit, um, pales in comparison to the, these things these soldiers seen. So it, it really kind of makes me think sometimes and, and wonder how they I could, well, how they could do what they did. Um, and, and my ancestor, uh, Owen, Owen McCauley, who's the, who's the guy that I'm portraying on here, uh, was in at 61, went all the way through 65. Uh, so as far as I can find, he was never wounded. He was sick a few times. Um, 
but four years of combat he saw it all and made it through so anyway just to take a little look at the Civil War soldier uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this over time because uh, there's a little bit I want to do with this particular impression uh, we will be trying to get into the field in the next day or next oh several months next year uh, probably get back into some bigger reenactments and um, they always ask or people always ask why do you do this and uh, truth be told um, I started doing this just to figure out what it was like and in college I uh, had a Civil War class great teacher and the books were good but it doesn't explain what the soldier was going through and so in trying to figure that out I met a couple Civil War reenactors and got involved in doing this and went to some of the bigger battles uh, the one the 150th and uh, in the the late 1980s um, and there's something to be said about being in line with all those guys firing muskets and marching at that time I'd only been in the army about six years so um, the camaraderie that I felt in the regular army as a young private and the reenactors was there and now 30 some years later and yeah, not quite 30 some 30 years later uh, I wonder if it's the same having seen the elephant so to speak getting back into it um, kind of want to know what it's like to feel it again but with this veterans view so to speak so we'll see all right all right so um, one, one more thing, you know, we had the federal forage cap, which I was wearing earlier, and uh, early in the war, and I know we know at Bull Run, Company K wore the Chesser's cap, probably with a Havelock from what evidence we have. And there are a couple photographs of them with the company designation letter, number K, or letter K up here, and then 69 on top. Uh, how long after Bull Run and the reorganization of the regiment from the, uh, the state militia? Um, into the New York Volunteers. Did they keep wearing the Chasseur cap? Uh, we don't know. But probably by the Peninsula campaign, the, the brass furniture anyway, probably wasn't being worn. Um, they probably will, majority of them went to the bummers or the forage caps, that is. Most of the Federals in the East and a majority of the Irish Brigade by photographs were wearing forage caps of some type or the other and not a slouch cap um, and I don't know why because the slouch cap is much more comfortable and much more protection from the Sun as you can see it doesn't provide a lot but uh, it's kind of a jaunty little cap and Esprit uh was pretty heavy during this time with the regiments um, I'm trying to think of what else to talk to you about and uh, <laughs> uh, that's really about it so, uh, only did a couple miles. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, might have a little bit of coffee and maybe do another mile or two and uh, see how these things work out. Uh, our uniform today is, is fully supplied with the exception of the musket uh, and the, the knapsack and, <laughs> and the great coat. And uh, what else? <laughs> the bayonet. Oh, no, wait, the bayonet, too. Um, blockade runner. Good friends of mine. Um, highly recommend them. I won't get into the whole uh, mainstream versus hardcore reenactors right now, but if you're getting started in reenacting, be aware that there is a significant difference between a uh, majority of reenactors to go out and to do this to have a good time and are slightly less historic than the hardcore reenactors. Um, I used to be a very hardcore reenactor. And I don't know where I fall in right now. I've been out of the hobby for a little while and a lot has changed. 
So uh, we'll see where I fit into this. I I don't want to. <laughs> I want to be historically as accurate as possible. At the same time, I'm kind of doing this for fun. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> And then I know I'm going to get a little crap from various reenactors that say, this is living history. This is not LARPing. Damn you, Thorn. Uh, well, <laughs> it, is, it is kind of role playing uh, and it's live action. Well, make of it as you will. Um, we are pretending to be soldiers. And, uh, <laughs> we're dressing up to do it and uh, we're pretending to fight other people so I don't know <laughs> there'd be a lot of people that are angry with me calling this a LARP but <laughs> it's kind of a LARP guys um, it's different it's different so uh, I guess the main difference is we are LARPing real history, uh, or at least we're trying to. And, and so that puts a, a different view on it, maybe? I don't know. Um, I guess in my mind, not that much of a difference. Um, there's a fine line between recreating history and dress it up and play and pretend that um, a lot of reenactors like to pretend that uh, they are doing. So, I don't know. Uh, my viewpoint is that I'm trying to recreate history as much as possible. Uh, but I kind of do that with LARPing too, uh, with the added benefit of orcs and magic. So, <laughs> take that. Take that as you will. Uh, if you're thinking about getting started reenacting, there's a lot of information out there on the net. Take a look and, and, and find someplace nearby that, that these guys do this and, and go and talk to them. It's um, What I've found is a lot of times they will let you come out and talk to them and maybe attend an event or two. And most of us have got extra gear and we can kit you out for, for one or two events. And after that, we kind of want you to, to take the step and, and uh, um, start spending your hard-earned cash. Yeah, it, it's an expensive hobby, but it's, it's, um, it's well worth it. Um, what I was talking about trying to understand what the soldier went through. Um, well, I went to an event. War stories, there we go. There we were. I went to an event, I can't tell you where it was. I think it was in Missouri, but it probably was in Tennessee. We were doing federal, and I got there late. And uh, crawled into a tent, they pointed me to the line. Uh, the camp line and I crawled into a tent wrapped up in my blanket and went to sleep uh, It rained all night long I got up the next morning had breakfast um, Over an open campfire with the guys got suited up Got my gear on and off we marched we were marching to the battlefield. This was a campaign event and So we we walked and we walked and we walked three or four miles and uh, there was a point when we're in the backwoods, and it's a dirt road. And we're in the backwoods of who the hell knows where we are. And all I can see in front of me is marching soldiers. And all I can see behind me is marching soldiers. There's probably four or five hundred of us on the Union force, I think. And at that moment, where all you can see is soldiers marching, and all you can hear is soldiers marching. No modern, nothing intruding into the, the moment, is what reenactors call it. I was like, yeah, yeah, this is what it was like. And another time, 
Another war story. I'm getting maudlin in my old age, kids. My first reenactment I ever went to, Wilson's Creek, Missouri. Uh, I was doing Confederate at the time with the 9th Texas. Great bunch of guys, still friends to this day. We're standing on the edge of a cornfield, looking at the Federals, uh, well, the Federal lines anyway, and we're standing at the edge of the cornfield, and we're in line of battle. So, imagine me in Confederate gear, standing basically like this, waiting, waiting for the orders. And we hear the trumpets and we hear the drums, and we see, the only thing that we can see in the cornfield is the federal flags above the corn coming at us. And that's, it's just, it was, it was a moment. And the kid next to me said, how many of them do you think there are? And I said, well, for every one of those sets of flags, there's probably three to 400 people. Being in the moment, being realistic, being accurate. That was probably 400 Federals total, not a couple of thousand. But it was a brigade sized element coming at us. There was three or four sets of flags. And at that moment, it was pretty good. And then the orders came to get ready to fire, and we did. It was a great event. Uh, <laughs> I could tell you war stories all day, but. Uh, Anyway, we'll wrap this up, and uh, so for the next two or three videos, maybe, I'll be talking about the Civil War, um, and reenacting, and living history, and LARPing the Civil War. The sun is up. It's starting to get warm. I'm wearing wool, and it's time to march a few miles. We'll see you next time. Take care. Arago bra. <laughs>